Welcome into the local angle. I'm Brian Barrett from Off the Pike, and we're now just north of two weeks away from the NFL season getting underway, and I'm starting to feel optimistic about the Patriots quarterback. We all know that it wasn't pretty last year for Mac Jones and the Patriots, but Mac was pretty good as a rookie, and we've seen signs throughout training camp in his limited preseason action as well that I feel pretty good about where Mac is entering year three. So one thing that we've seen in recent NFL history is quarterbacks that go from a horrible coaching situation to a really good coaching situation on offense. Those players, mainly quarterbacks that we're talking about here, take a huge leap. And what we saw last year is Matt Patricia was inarguably a disaster for the Patriots. Even Bill Belichick himself acknowledged that by moving on from him. And Bill O'Brien has been a successful coach in a lot of different areas, right? First of all, as an NFL offensive coordinator with the Patriots, he was really good. Rob Gronkowski broke the record in terms of touchdowns for a tight end in Bill O'Brien's season here as the play caller. Now, I understand Gronk's a great player, but Bill O'Brien deserves some credit for the Patriots being better that season offensively than they were the year prior with Josh McDaniels. He also had success as a head coach with both Penn State and with the Houston Texans. Remember, he made the playoffs in back-to-back seasons where his leading passers were Brian Hoyer and Brock Osweiler, respectively, right? Like, those guys led his team in passing, and they still made it to the postseason. And then at Alabama, he goes there as the offensive coordinator. Bryce Young wins the Heisman. So Bill O'Brien is a good offensive coordinator. His issues in Houston were his GMing duties, not his coaching ability. So Mac should get a boost from Bill O'Brien. So let's look at two recent examples of young quarterbacks that went from bad offensive coaching situations to really good ones. I'll start with Trevor Lawrence. So Trevor Lawrence, his rookie season, he gets Urban Meyer as the head coach. (laughs) We all know that was a mess. And Daryl Bevel as the offensive coordinator. Just a complete dumpster fire there in Jacksonville. So Lawrence's problem in his rookie season is he held on to the ball too long and he threw too many interceptions because of that. So in 2021, He threw 17 interceptions. That was tied for the most in the NFL. In 2022, that was down to eight interceptions. His completion percentage, 59.6%, was 33rd of 39 qualifiers in 2021. In 2022, that jumped to 66.3%. Then you just look at his passer rating. He was at 71.9 in 2021. That was 36th of 39 qualifiers. Only Zach Wilson and Mike Glennon were worse than him or two of the three guys that were worse than him that season and then in 2022 that passer rating is at 95.2 which was the 10th best in the entire NFL so he went from 36 in passer rating all the way up to 10th with the coaching change so Urban Meyer just getting out of the building was huge but how did Doug Peterson a good offensive coach like Bill O'Brien is a good offensive coach how did he get the best out of his quarterback how did Trevor Lawrence go from turnover prone to one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. He made the Pro Bowl last year. He had a really good season, and I like his odds at MVP. But if you look at 2022, he was at 2.52 seconds in terms of his time to throw. That was the fifth quickest in the NFL. You go to 2021, he was at 2.85. So that was 28. So that's a huge gap in terms of 23 spots. He was holding on to the ball in 2021. In 2022, he was getting rid of the ball quickly because they schemed it up for the quarterback. And if you look at his numbers, when he got rid of the ball in less than two and a half seconds in that 2022 season, that was 56.4% of his dropbacks with getting rid of the ball less than two and a half seconds. That was the fourth best mark in the entire NFL. If you go to 2021, that number was at just 42.4%. That was 30th. So he jumped up 26 spots in terms of getting rid of the ball quicker than two and a half seconds. And the percentage points up 14 percentage points. And the results were great. If you look at those numbers, when he got rid of the ball in less than two and a half seconds, 17 touchdowns tied for third, 2,411 yards, that was fourth, and the 105.8 passer rating was seventh. So he's really good when he gets rid of the ball quickly. If you go to 2021, the attempts north of two and a half seconds, it was 57.4% of his dropbacks. That was the 10th highest rate. That number in 2022 was just 43.3%, 38th of 41 So he was constantly getting rid of the ball quickly, as we illustrated. And if you look at the numbers when he held on to the ball for more than two and a half seconds in 2021, 13 picks tied for the most, 5.8 yards per attempt, 37th out of 39 qualifiers, and a 56.4 rating, which was 56 out of 59 qualifiers. So what Doug Peterson did for Trevor Lawrence 
He made it easier for him to read the field, and he got rid of the ball quickly. That's scheme. He's scheming guys open. So that's example one. Example two of this is Tua. Tua went from basically a co-offensive coordinator situation with Eric Studsville and George George Gotze as the co-offensive coordinators in Miami to Mike McDaniel calling games, where Mike McDaniel had a really good season. So it was kind of a weird situation because he had two guys there. Studsville's still there on the coaching staff, and Gotze's now coaching tight ends with Baltimore. But what happened there was it was the RPO game that was the difference for Tua compared to the previous season. So we've hit this before in terms of my pod about what made Tua successful. If you look at Tua last season, 847 passing yards out of RPOs, that was the most in the league, and he only played in 13 games. So if you go back to 2020, that number was at 195, which was 17th, and he did that in 10 games. But if you think about it, 65.2 of his yards came via RPOs, and he averaged 272.9 yards per game. So that was 23.9% of his passing yardage. Nearly a quarter of his passing yardage came via RPOs. If you go to that number in 2020, it's 19.5 yards per game. He averaged 204.1. So if you look at it from that perspective, it's just 9.6 in terms of the percentage of his passing yards that came via RPOs. So we're talking about a climb of 14.3 percentage points. Just massive, right? And the numbers with Tua, in general, were just way better last season. He went from a 90.1 rating in 2020, which was 20th, to a 105.5 rating last season, which was second. The yards per attempt went from to 8.9 last year, which was first in the league. He was at 6.8 in 2021. That was 25th. So with Tua, it was about catering the system to his strengths. RPO game, getting rid of the ball quickly, quick decisions for the quarterback. Mike McDaniel did that. And he also protected a bad offensive line, which maybe the Patriots are dealing with this situation as well, where he was getting rid of the ball quickly. So if you look at those two guys, it's two examples of quarterbacks that took massive jumps in both production and perception because of their play caller, where with Trevor Lawrence, it's, hey, we got to get rid of the ball quickly. With Tua, it's the RPO game, something he did at the collegiate level, like Mac Jones. So what we're already seeing with Mac Jones during training camp, and in particular in his limited preseason action, is he's already getting help from the offensive coordinator, right? This preseason, the Patriots have the third highest RPO percentage in the NFL. That's 18.2%. This is from Pro Football Focus. Last season, they were at 20th. That's 7.4%. Mac is really good at this, right? Where he's either giving it to the running back real quickly or finding Kendrick Bourne like he did in that first preseason game right over the middle. It's quick decisions. This is where Mac thrived at the collegiate level is the RPO game. And I've been through this in terms of, if you just look at the total dropbacks last year via RPOs for Mac, it was at just 19. 4.3% of his dropbacks came via RPOs. And looking at the play caller, Bill O'Brien, well, when he was coaching Bryce Young last year, The RPO game, 54 attempts via RPOs, 14.2%. So Mac was at 4.3 with the Patriots last year. Bryce Young was at 14.2. So 10 percentage points higher than Mac. If you go back to Mac at Alabama, he was the best RPO quarterback in the country. 73 of 78, 10 touchdowns, no interceptions. This is what Mac is really good at, is the RPO game. Last season, the RPO game, it just was not there. And One of the things that the RPO game will help with Mac Jones is getting rid of the ball quickly, right? Last year, 44.1% of Mac's dropbacks came with less than two and a half seconds. That was 23rd of 41 qualifiers. So that number is low, right? He needs to get rid of the ball quickly more often than that. And the evidence is, well, if you look at it, he was actually good when he got rid of the ball quickly, less than two and a half seconds. Now, a lot of quarterbacks will be that way, but in particular with Mac, you need him to get rid of the ball quickly. Because he's not going to extend the play like a Joe Burrow where he's buying time in the pocket or taking off and running like, say, for example, Jalen Hurts or Lamar Jackson. So when Mac got rid of the ball with less than two and a half seconds, he completed 73.4% of his passes, eight touchdowns, three interceptions. If you go to when Mac Jones, when he had more than two and a half seconds in the pocket, 55.9% of his dropbacks, he completed just 58% of his passes. Six touchdowns, eight interceptions, and a 78.6 passer rating, which was 28th of 41 quarterbacks. So that number was brutal. And if you just take the interceptions, that means almost 73% of his picks last year, eight out of the 11, came when he held on to the ball for more than two and a half seconds. And his passer rating dropped 13.6 percentage points. 
And if you look at Mack in that preseason game, and I get it, very small sample size, but seven of his 12 dropbacks were less than two and a half seconds. That's 58.3%. You look at last season, only three quarterbacks were north of 58% in terms of their dropbacks coming in less than two and a half seconds. Tom Brady and Joe Burrow, just two of the best quarterbacks in the NFL. So, well, Brady retired, but you get the point. One of the all-time great quarterbacks. This is also where Bill O'Brien comes in, and he builds the quick game. Get rid of the ball quickly. Use RPOs, because that's what Mac is really good at. So I believe, if you look at it, a well-designed scheme with Bill O'Brien will take advantage of what Mac Jones does well. It's a crazy concept. Last year, they didn't dig into it. Mac was the best RPO quarterback in college football. He won the national championship that way. And they didn't utilize it at all last year with the Patriots. I expect Bill O'Brien to do a ton of it because guess what? He coached at Alabama. He used RPOs with Bryce Young. And now I look at some of the futures up right now at FanDuel. Mac Jones, 20 plus touchdowns is at minus 110. I like that. He was at 22 in his rookie season. And then the other one I really like is the alternate regular season wins that they have up at FanDuel right now. Eight and a half wins for the Patriots is at plus 220. Just really good value, right? If you really think about it, and by the way, if you want to go over nine and a half, you can get that at plus 360. The Patriots won eight games last year. They had the Raiders and the Bengals games where, remember, Jacoby Myers threw away literally the game against the Raiders, just threw it to Chandler Jones. And then if you look at the end of the Bengals game, the team that played for the AFC championship, the Patriots had them beat. It was 22 to 18 with 55 seconds left. They're going in to score at the five yard line. Ramondre fumbles. So that's two games right there. The Patriots easily could have won. And if you look at it this year, you would expect the Patriots to be significantly better just from an offensive perspective. And the defense was good last year. All right, a lot more coming up here on The Local Angle. You'll hear from John Jastrzemski from New York, New York, the guys from the Philly Special, and Jason Goff from the Full Go in Chicago. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by Atlassian. Atlassian software like Jira, Confluence, and Trello help power global collaboration for all teams so they can accomplish everything that's impossible alone. Because individually, we're great, but together, we're so much better. Learn how to unleash the potential of your team at Atlassian.com, A-T-L-A-S-S-I-A-N.com, Atlassian. Tap the banner or visit this episode's page to learn more. Welcome to the Ringers Philly special and to those of you watching the local angle on FanDuel TV, Sheil Kapadia here with the man Ben Solak and ace producer Cliff Augustine. We are starting, Ben, a three-part season preview today, okay? So if they listen, if there are roster moves or trades or whatever, we'll of course get to those, but the season is rapidly approaching. This week, we're doing the offense, next week, we're doing the defense, and the following week, we go on the record with our predictions for the 2023 NFL season. How does that sound, my friend? Uh, yeah, I think I said before, I'm very ready for projections. I'm at all times ready to make predictions. You're the one we've been waiting on. Let's just go with some big questions. Let's go on the record with some takes. So let's get started with that. My first question to you, Ben, about the Eagles offense is what is your biggest question about the Eagles offense going into the 2023 season. What do you got? Yeah, play caller's got to be the big question for me. Uh, I know that you and I have had a conversation a couple of times now about Shane Steichen. And, 20 and, or 30 times, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the lore and the, uh, the uh, myth and the legend that's developed around Steichen. But in general, I feel like just so often last year, we would come on a postgame pod and we would say, wow, just like really well-called well called game. It was very rare that we... 
highlighted a third and six. I said, what was this play called? It made no sense. Uh, fourth and two. Why do they do this this way? You know, we'd always come on and be like, oh, the freaking Goddard screen worked again. You know what I'm saying? Like, what's, what a surprise. Like, oh, just uh, the pockets were so nice. The play action. They got them out of the pocket. They ran the ball well. They ran the ball this way. Like, it was just, it was so rare that we would find a week where it felt like the play calling was an issue or was something to, to highlight as a weakness for this team. Uh, Steichen out, Brian Johnson in. Don't know what to expect, right? If this were Brian Schonheimer, I could be like, all right, he's been doing this for 15 years. This is probably how it's going to go. But with Brian Johnson, it's just such a, such a, a total unknown uh, from a guy who, who like situationally called plays at the college level, hasn't really uh, had much experience at the NFL level, that even if Johnson's like a fine play caller, I think it'll be a step below Steichen, who I thought was a really impressive play caller. Uh, and then there's also the possibility that, you know, for the first year of Johnson, there's just bumps. There's there's issues. The first couple games, they're getting play calls in late, and they're getting procedural penalties. And then they, they have a great stretch of offense, and then a defense comes with a counterpunch they weren't expecting, and they just can't adjust fast enough, right? Like, there, there's, just, there's a lot of ways that the play calling affects the Eagles in, in, in like, little degrees that like can stack up and, and equal like a loss you know here or a, a just a, a little wind out of the offensive sales there so play calling gotta be my biggest question i do agree with sort of the mechanics of it like i could like we really didn't see that last year where it's like oh how did they not get this play call in they had to waste a timeout jalen hurts is all upset there uh in the huddle that kind of thing really did not happen they, they were very good at that avoiding those sort of unforced error. So that would not shock me if like the first two, three weeks, whatever, first month of the season, uh, we saw some of that. Overall, I've said it before, I think Brian Johnson's in a really good spot where he's got a quarterback who can kind of uh, take control here, where he's got a head coach who is very involved in the offensive game planning and scheming, where he's got an offensive line coach who was in charge of the run game. Now, what you're saying is true. Those three hours, and, and you did, to be fair, this isn't revisionist history. You were pointing out last year uh, after the game that that was where Shane Steichen really shined. And I think that's fair. He did do uh, a really good job. So we'll see. I could be wrong about this one. I think Brian Johnson's uh, going to be okay, but I don't think it's ridiculous to have that as your biggest question. My biggest question is, how much more can Jalen Hurts improve? This is like a question mm -hmm. I feel like you and I, it's one of our first podcasts. I remember, I don't know if it was Philly Special or Ringer NFL Show, where we both kind of agreed like it's people overrate how much a player in the NFL can actually improve. Like it doesn't happen that often where they go from one thing to a totally different thing in a span of one, two, three years. And Jalen Hurts has just flat out been the exception. I mean, he's 25 years old. We've seen huge improvements every year. He's been in the NFL, and I don't think that we've seen his ceiling yet. Like, I don't think this is going to be something where we say, wow, 2022 was an outlier season. Everything went right. They got to the Super Bowl, and for the next five years, you're kind of chasing that, and he can't quite get there. I think there's still plenty of room for Jalen Hurts uh, to improve. If you just look at it statistically, you know, last year they were, uh, let me see, he was ninth in EPA per pass play and 18th in drop back success rate. I, I think those numbers would probably surprise people. Now, some of that was a lot of these games were blowouts in the fourth quarter and your numbers get dinged a little bit uh, there for sure. But it's not like this was just consistently every game, every week, the passing game was clicking. Now that doesn't take into account the run game, which really was like, you know, will, might go down as one of the best, uh, if not the best in franchise history. So uh, I'm probably clouded by, you know, attending whatever it was, four or five practices this summer and just watching right. Hertz and being like, man, he's not missing a lot of throws. He's accurate. He's throwing on the move. He's trying throws where I thought in the past, you know what? He might not even try that degree of difficulty. And so uh, I think the O line is going to be fine. I think the weapons are really good. I think Brian Johnson's going to be fine. I'm curious to see like what version of Hertz do we get? Are we saying, He's maintained his level of play from, from last year. He's taken a step back or is he getting better? So that's my biggest question. And that, and that leads to my next question uh, for you, Ben, because I, I really actually, I actually we, we've talked so much about the, uh, as I say, minute, other people call it minutia. Uh, what do you say? Who, what do you team. think you are saying minute? That's not a real thing. Yeah, that's a good thing. Min, minute. Uh, my second question for you, Ben, is where will Jalen Hurts rank in the nerd stats? I'm talking EPA per pass play and drop back success rate by season's end. I just told you last year, he was ninth in EPA per pass play. Uh, that includes, for those wondering, that includes sacks, that includes scrambles. It does not include the designed runs. As I mentioned, he was 19th in drop back success rate. Uh, and if you're wondering how are those two so different, basically it means that 
Explosive plays, good. Not turning the ball over, good. But kind of the down-to-down stuff, uh, they were a little lower there in success rate. Success rate gives you the same uh, sort of, yes, it was successful if it's an eight-yard completion on third and seven, or if it's a 50-yard completion on third and seven. It's just, was this a positive play uh, for the quarterback and the offense or not? So now I'll find out. Where do you think Jalen Hurts ends up compared to last year in those statistical categories? Uh, 12th and 12th. 12th and okay. 15th. Get about okay. like EPA a little bit worse. Success rate a little bit better. And I think that's because the Eagles offense is probably going to get the same treatment that most really, really good offenses get in the NFL nowadays, which is that teams are just going to start playing them a little bit deeper. Right, you're just gonna instead of lining the safeties up at 15, you're gonna line them up at 17, and you're gonna tell the corners to play a little bit further off in zone, and you're gonna make Hertz and, and AJ Brown and Devontae Smith throw more comebacks and curls instead of goes and posts, right? And you're gonna you're gonna even try with to, that run game, they're gonna be willing to play those safeties that deep. Well, so right, so I didn't say like oh they're gonna play more too high and less single high. I just said they're gonna push everybody back a little bit, right? And so I okay. like. Uh, that thing is like I definitely don't think you can lighten the box, right? I think that's that that that's never going to work for you. So I think just when you when you line up and when you and, and when you think pass, right? When you're in third and seven or second and ten or whatever, um, you're just going to try to play things a little bit more passively. Like uh, the Eagles tend not to put a ton of guys into the concept, right? They don't really th- put five guys out in the concept a lot, and so they don't stress your zone coverage the way that like. A, like an Andy Reid, Patrick Mahomes team is where it's like, let's throw so many bodies out there and like have a ton of geometry and you have to have your eyes everywhere and so on and so forth. They'll just put like three into the concept, four into the concept. They'll keep it half field reads and stuff like that. So if you really want to make a conscious choice of like, we're going to take away the deep routes, take away the intermediate routes, make Hertz like check it down to the running back, check it down to the tight ends. You can do that to, with some success. And, 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 and you saw teams try to do that this year, right? Like the Colts did a lot of that when they played, when they played Indy. Um, and so I think that that'll, take maybe some of the deep passing plays out of it. But Hertz is also a very mature passer who's going to be willing to keep the offense on schedule. Um, like when I saw those numbers, I was way more surprised by 19th in dropback success rate than I was in 19th in EPA per play. To me, that was like, oh, I would have imagined they were more successful on a down-to-down basis than that. Um, so eliminate a couple, yeah, eliminate some sacks. That way you can stay ahead of the sticks and uh, be willing to check the football down and take the underneath stuff. I wouldn't be surprised if their offense is a little bit more efficient, but a little bit less explosive. That tends to be what happens to these top offenses. Like Kevin Clark for us at the Ringer just wrote a great piece for the Bengals offense and how it be, had to become less explosive and more efficient because that's how defenses were playing them. Wouldn't be surprised to see the same thing happen to the Eagles. Uh, I think he's going to go in the opposite direction, not in terms of, you know, the, the spe- I, I agree with you that they might be less reliant on the explosive plays and maybe more reliant on the efficiency. But uh, I actually think he's going to uh, take a leap forward. And, and my reason for that is just that, again, when you're 25 years old, it's not linear, but at the same time, you're picking up things that, you know, I, I remember Pete Carroll used to be like Russell Wilson's like, you know, fifth or sixth year. And he's like, now's when a quarterback actually is learning stuff and mastering stuff. It takes a lot of time. And I think that's probably true. And, and just how young he is, the work he puts in, I'm not trying to go big, you know, intangible, intangible, this and that. But I do think he is the, the rare case where I do think he's going to improve year in and year out. The other thing is this, if you take out the fourth quarters last year, he was sixth in EPA per pass play and 13th in success rate. So there was a lot of times where it was the fourth quarter, maybe they're running the ball on first and second down and then, uh, you know, throwing the ball on third down, but it's like, hey, don't turn the ball over. It's not like they have to make something happen. I think they're going to be in a lot more close games this year. I think they're going to be trailing in the fourth quarter more uh, this year. And so uh, I think you could see a little bump there where it looks a little bit more like it did in the first three quarters. So I think he makes a leap. I think he's going to finish top five in EPA per pass play this year. I've got him fifth in EPA per pass Ooh, play, 10th in success rate. Uh, I just feel like he's got the pieces around him to make another leap forward. Again, maybe I'm clouded by what my eyes have seen uh, on the practice fields at the NovaCare complex. And, you know, these things, again, sometimes you, you're good and then you regress a little bit or the luck doesn't go in your favor. Uh, I just look at the way he was good at avoiding turnovers and, and that's even not getting lucky, but with the turnover worthy plays like pro football focus uh, ranks, he was high uh, up there. And so I think he's good at that. And I think he can be a little bit more efficient on a down to down basis. All right, let's take a little quick break. We will come back with more. Thanks to everyone 
who is watching on FanDuel TV. Remember, you can listen to the Philly special on Spotify or wherever you get your podcast. To those of you listening, we will be right back. Shout out to everybody at the local angle. Shout out to FanDuel TV. This is episode 280, Chris Sutton, 280. Episode 280 of the Full Go Podcast brought to you by the ringer, of course, Spotify is the gang. My name is Jason Goff, and I'm joined by my cohorts, Tony Gill, Kyle Williams, and Chris Sutton. And we got some news. Certain, certain pods, you know, you got to move around. You got you to gotta feel around and search for a little content, search for a little news, roll well, it up. Not today. And- no oh, side. no, 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 no. It is a pre-rolled for y'all out here tonight because unfortunately for some people, and fortunately for some fans, the White Sox have moved on from their executive vice president, Kenny Williams, and their GM, Rick Hahn. And I hope I am giving them both the credit that they need on their titles. I'm not trying to be disrespectful in any way. I want to talk about the struggles of getting fired <laughs> publicly, but also what White Sox fans should be looking forward to. Now, of course, a couple of days ago, the story came out that the White Sox might be looking for a new new place, new home. Guaranteed rate field has become archaic. Six years from now, the lease is going to be up. We talked to Greg Hines right here on the Full Go podcast from the Chicago Cranes Business Journal about it. You can catch it on episode 280 if you choose to do so. So we got the business side of this thing. You know, we go outside for a half an hour, and next thing you know, Kenny Williams and Rick Hahn are no longer a part of this organization. And I want to say this before we get into the actual factuals of what happened. Kenny Williams, for him being one of the few black general managers in baseball, right? And I'm talking about history. (laughs) There's been a handful of them in history. For him to win the World Series that he won, in 2005, with Ozzie Guillen and Don Cooper and a slew of players that were thrown together, that came together to make a magical season for all the Chicago and all the Chicago White Sox fans, we will never forget that, ever, ever, ever. But there was a time where Kenny Williams was being looked at like the boogeyman. He was making decisions that weren't leading to results. And Rick Hahn, who worked under him, got the GM position. Kenny got bumped up. And people thought maybe, just maybe, Kenny was still doing the puppet strings and making things move behind the scenes. A few years pass, and then Rick Hahn gets the full power and impact that a GM should have. And we have what we have right here. You want to know where it changed for me, White Sox fans? Because I'll never forget it. Doing a remote for the local Chicago sports radio station at the Under Armour store of all places when it first opened up. And the Todd Frazier deal was announced. And we had Rick Hahn on. And I asked him about the state of the team, the future of the team, and what this deal truly means. And he took umbrage. You know, he took umbrage because the question at that point seemed like a loaded question. And it seemed like I was shading Todd Frazier. But I, as a White Sox fan, was looking forward to the next time this team would compete. Lo and behold, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years later, We sit where we sit in 2023, where we've had two of the most disappointing seasons in Chicago sports history. It's not just White Sox history. And if you've been listening to this pod, you understand how crestfallen we as White Sox fans have been and will continue to be because this firing only means that you've cleared out people who are making decisions that yielded the results. It doesn't show that you can hire people that will make better results. And I'm looking forward to seeing what Jerry Reinsdorf and the crew do in terms of hiring practices, because we've always heard and talked about how Jerry Reinsdorf treats his teams like a family. We saw it with Jerry Krause. We saw it with John Paxson. We've seen it with Kenny Williams. We've seen it with Rick Hahn. And of course, championships have been yielded with those relationships, but also you kind of scratch your head sometimes with some of the moves that are made and thinking, would this happen in any other city? I applaud Jerry Reinsdorf for the loyalty that he's shown to his employees. There are so many stories that Bulls fans and Sox fans will never hear of in terms of the the kindness that Jerry Reinsdorf has bestowed upon his employees and former players. Jerry Reinsdorf has made sure guys have been 
dug out of bankruptcy. He's he's made sure that families were okay in the midst of turmoil. Like he's done a lot of things behind the scenes. But also, we have to talk about how this team has been represented, how this team has spoken to its fan base. A fan base, by the way, that has been rife with apathy for a very, very long time. And every once in a while gets to peek its summer head out and hope for a little bit of sunny skies, right? Not the clouds and the rainfall that we've seen specifically for the last year and a half. So when I heard the news, because our guy, Tony Gill, texted to us during the group chat, I was on the way out to go see the Power Book 4 Force premiere. Joseph Secor is also on episode 280 of the Full Go Podcast. Shout out to Tommy from Power. But on the way out, I was thinking the entire ride, what does this mean for me as a White Sox fan? And I also want to put it in context what this means professionally for these two men. You know, Rick Hahn and Kenny Williams should be given their flowers. It's not a lot of championships that come through Chicago, especially baseball-wise. We've had two in the last, what, 110, 112, 113 years, 2016, and of course, with the White Sox. So I'm grateful as a Chicago White Sox fan for Kenny Williams and Rick Hahn. But I also understand in this business and in the industry that we talk about, in the industry that we're in, as well as podcasters and sports observers, that if the results aren't there, maybe time to move on. The results haven't been there, but they've been they've been sporadic in terms of it hasn't been so sequential that it's been nine, ten years of piss poor management and piss poor decisions. But when it's time to really re-up and start to get this thing going, because me and every other White Sox fan that I knew of was talking crazy in 2018, 2019, warning people what 2020 and beyond would be. And now we sit here in 2023 with a rebuild that is stalled out with a manager, legendary Hall of Fame manager, who had to be ushered out the door in Tony La Russa by the way, for all intents and purposes, wasn't Rick Hahn's call. So we'll get to that too, by the way. But the the Tony La Russa thing, now the Pedro Graffold thing, which let's face it, if I can find a worse first year for a manager in Chicago sports history, it'd be hard. It'd be hard. Talk about all the things, the fundamentals, the base running, the hitting the cutoff man, the, like the effort. Talking. Big stuff. Big shit, stuff. crazy! I was out like, here. yo, okay. Pedro, okay, came sir, and planted the flag. Yo, we about to play like the Royals, but we gonna have a budget. And I'm like, oh, okay, I'm rocking with you. And we saw what this season turned out to be from the very start. Mike Clevenger and his issues, then it transformed to injuries. Yohan Mankata. Everybody thought, hey, why is Yohan Mankata being forced to play with a back injury? We see what you got out of Yoan Mankata. And by the way, it's been an underwhelming career in terms of White Sox hopefuls. Because when you traded for Yoan Mankata, the Chris Sale trade, which was ushered in by Rick Hahn, you look at that Yoan Mankata trade, Andrew Benintendi was the guy that the Red Sox didn't want to give up, by the way, which is crazy because Andrew Benintendi is now playing in the outfield for the White Sox. But Yoan Mankata has lived up to a good prospects billing. Yo Mankata was a top-tier prospect. You don't trade an ace-like figure for Chris Sale for a guy like Yo Mankata if you're not expecting him to blow up. So the way that he's been handled and the way that he's performed has been above average at best. And I think he has all the talent in the world. I think when he's right, he's probably one of the two or three best players on this team. So the, the the reports that came out that he was forced to play with an injury or you didn't take care of him and that sidelined him even more, it just speaks to uh, the lack of foresight that this organization has kind of been run with. They've been kind of chasing their tails for the last couple of years, even with a, a stacked deck. And let's talk about that stacked deck. Dylan Cease has a terrific Cy Young-like year, comes into this year, never having pitched that innings load. He hasn't been the Dylan Cease that we saw last year. Michael Kopech. When Michael Kopech was acquired and through the draft, White Sox fans thought they had an ace for 10, 12 years to come. They thought it was going to be the second coming of a guy like Chris Sale in terms of the, the impact 
and the intimidation factor that you need to have on the mound. This dude is a six foot five, six foot six, stocky, sturdy, power arm, flowing blonde hair. He had all the makings of what Noah Syndergaard was supposed to be for the New York Mets, to be honest with you. That hasn't worked out. And then you try to piecemeal it with moves like Yasmani Grandal, who you gave the most money to in White Sox franchise history as far as a free agent is concerned. He's hit 44 home runs in the last four years after hitting 28 in his last year with the Milwaukee Brewers. There's a lot of reasons why Rick Hahn isn't here. But the Kenny Williams thing is very interesting to me because all this stems from, to me, and I could be wrong, I've been wrong before. I'm going to be wrong again. But there's no way in hell that this story drops a day ago now, (laughs) a day ago, less than 30 hours when we're taping this. This story drops about the White Sox looking at other sites, the White Sox looking at other cities, the White Sox looking at other locations. And then all of a sudden, your entire, your entire hierarchy, especially at the top, is let go. No, there's something fishy here. And it's unfortunate because White Sox fans didn't need anything to be more apathetic about. And I think for all of the celebration that we have when it comes to newness and new beginnings, two people got fired. And it's never fun to get fired in public. This is a part of the business. I'm sure Rick Hahn will catch on elsewhere. We'll see what Kenny Williams' thoughts are in terms of continuing to do this or being in the baseball business. He's gotten to the point now where he's made a lot of money. And maybe he just wants to settle down with his his family again and call it a life. I'm not mad at it. I'm not mad at it. You have to move on in sports. We see people get fired all the time. This was a surprise. But for me, the Todd Frazier trade years ago was like, oh, okay. I see where we're on. And shout out to Todd Frazier. Shout out to Rick Hahn. Shout out to anybody who got fired today. I never like to see anybody get fired. This is the business that we are in. I can appreciate it. And we're going to talk further about this because I got some other things to say that aren't local angle suitable, by the way. All right. So shout out to the local angle. Shout out to FanDuel TV. You can catch us Sundays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, or an emergency pod when someone gets fired right here on the Full Go Podcast. Welcome back to the local angle here on FanDuel TV. I'm John Jastrzemski, the host of New York, New York on the Ringer Podcast Network. And as we sit here, the New York Yankees, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, are in the middle of their longest losing streak since 1982. The Yankees have lost nine consecutive games. And, you know, in case you were wondering about what was going on in the world the last time the Yankees lost nine games in a row. Ronald Reagan was president of the United States. Uh, An album by the name of Thriller was number one on the charts, rocking and rolling every which way. Olivia Newton-John's Physical was the number one song in America. And Clyde King, yeah, Clyde King was the manager of the New York Yankees. So, Think about the world in 1982. Think about where we're at in 2023 and acknowledge and realize that this is the first time since then that the Yankees have gone and lost nine games in a row when they're double digit games out of the wild card race, their season. And we've talked about this now over the last couple of weeks. It's over. It's done. So there's no salvaging it. There's no getting around it. And I've said it multiple times, and I am not being dramatic. I am not using hyperbole. This is what you call an accurate portrayal. I've been a Yankee fan since 1993. I understand that I come from the spoiled, entitled Yankee generation that lived through the late 1990s, which, by the way, Will never, you could quote me on this. You could put it on my tombstone as far as I'm concerned. You will never see a team in Major League Baseball ever again go and win four titles in five years and go to the World Series five out of six times. Won't happen. As long as I'm on this earth, won't happen. So I know I lived through that and Jeter and Mariano and 
Pettit and Posada and Bernie Williams and all of the winning seasons, even with playoff disappointments, mixed in along the way. This is not even close, folks. It's the worst Yankee season of my lifetime. And I think now with the team 10 and a half games out of a wild card spot, and you know for all intents and purposes, the season is over. What you're getting on a lot of different platforms is the, how did we get here? And it didn't happen overnight. The Yankees didn't just snap a finger. This is not 1964 to 1965 where the team got old all of a sudden and they went from Game 7 of the World Series to a losing operation for a decade. Like, this was far more gradual. And there's not one individual significant move that kind of set all of this into effect. Yes, the Donaldson trade was awful, was hideous, was one of the worst trades in the Brian Cashman tenure. But in years past, the Yankees have survived moves like that. Even though John Carlos Stanton, you look at his postseason resume for the Yankees, it's been quite good. You could make a case that the trade for Stanton and making the Yankees this lumbering, right-handed type of lineup without balance, without lefty-righty, maybe that set off a negative chain of events going back to the winter of 2017 and into 2018. There's some truth in that, too. But again, it's tough to totally rag on Stanton throughout his Yankee tenure when in the postseason, which is what you were judged on in Yankee years, in Yankee lore, if you will, He's delivered. But to me, if you're going to pinpoint the biggest reason why we sit here today in 2023 and the Yankees are on the verge of their first losing season since 1992, this is the gradual conclusion of the failed era of the quote-unquote baby bombers. And I remember it well. 2017, leaving Yankee Stadium, ALCS, Judge, Sanchez, Bird, knowing the likes of Andujar and Frazier and Torres were on the way. Yes, the Yankees lost a heartbreaking seventh game in Houston, but they were ahead of schedule. They were heavy underdogs in the division series and shocked the Cleveland Indians by winning three straight games. Cleveland team that made it to Game 7 of the World Series the prior year. Like, at that point in time, you weren't betting on the Baby Bomber Corps winning one World Series. You would have invested heavy revenue on FanDuel Sportsbook over the idea that the Yankees would go and win multiple championships with that group to the point where some foolishly had the audacity to try to compare what the Yankees had going with the Baby Bombers to what the Yankees had going in the 1990s. Just think about that for a minute. Think about how outrageous that sounds. And Aaron Judge has lived up to his end of the bargain. He has turned himself into one of the best players in all baseball. He sets Roger Maris's AL home run record. He's going to be a Yankee for life. He's going to be Uh, a guy that ends up in Monument Park when it's all said and done, like Aaron Judge should be excluded from this conversation to some degree because he didn't fail as a quote-unquote baby bomber. Now, maybe he's failed as far as leading a team to a championship. That's a conversation for a different day. But to say Judge has failed as a player is nonsense. The guy's one of the best players in the sport. But for the other guys on this team over the time period, Sanchez, Bird, Andahar, Frazier, even to a lesser extent, Glaber Torres. These Yankees failing to develop and failing to live up to their potential, that to me is the biggest reason the Yankees are in the position that they're in. Because in baseball, now more than ever before, you can't just build a team through free agency and free agency alone. Look at the New York Mets who have tried that over the last two years and have now come to their senses realizing that, yeah, player development, having young, athletic, 
20-something position players is what you need in order to have a sustainable, winning, top-notch operation. The Yankees thought they had that going. They fail miserably. And when you look at why they're in the position that they're in right now, which is then Berry, and with serious questions about the future and what's next and what is this team and what is this organization going to look like, in many ways, you pinpoint what you saw from 2017 on, a lack of player development, and that's where you're at. Now, on a much happier note, you will have the Jet Giant preseason finale Saturday night. And this game on Saturday night has become far more intriguing and far more compelling because of the news that broke on Sunday and Monday. And that is that Aaron Rodgers, for the first time, will be suiting up and that Aaron Rodgers will be playing at least one or two series in the Jet Giant game at MetLife Stadium. And before you were going to be the person to say, oh, how dare Aaron Rodgers play in this game? What are the Jets doing? What are they What are they risking them in a preseason game for? You think the Jets made this decision without the consent and without the blessing of number 12? Or now number 8? Come on now. Aaron Rodgers, whether the Jets want to say it or not, Probably made it clear. Hey, guess what? Before I go out there, week one, Monday Night Football, September the 11th against the Buffalo Bills, I want to put this uniform on. I want to have a series or two in this building. I want to maybe work out some jitters, work out some kinks, maybe take a hit, and be ready to go. There's always a risk in playing anyone in a preseason game. But if the player tells you, This is what I want to do when he's a four-time MVP and when he's a future Hall of Famer. Hey, guess what? You are going to listen to the individual player. So it's a far more compelling watch for me, that's for sure. I don't think we're going to take much stock one way or another on what we see from Aaron Rodgers' performance, but it'll be out there. And it's a little appetizer. It's a shrimp cocktail before you have the filet mignon medium rare of seeing Aaron Rodgers in that Jet uniform. And if it hasn't clicked in already, and I don't know how it hasn't, between hard knocks and watching every uh, film clip imaginable from Aaron Rodgers in training camp and practice sessions, what have you, it's going to feel real, real when you see Aaron Rodgers taking on the New York Giants. Now, the Giants, they've kind of flown under the radar a little bit over these last couple weeks. The Jets have Aaron Rodgers. The Jets are on hard knocks. The Jets are getting a lot of New York City's attention. I know a lot of the Sharps are believers in the idea that the Giants are a team poised for regression. Second year coach, got the first year coach bump, soft schedule, much tougher schedule. I got news for you. I don't buy it. The reason I don't buy it is because the Giants are far better. They're far more talented. Look at their offense. They didn't have Darren Waller a year ago. They didn't have Jalen Hyatt a year ago. They didn't have Paris Campbell a year ago. Make the argument, those are their three best playmakers outside of Saquon Barkley going into the year. I think this quarterback is going to take a step forward. I think this pass rush, which missed way too much time with injuries last year, is going to take a major step forward. And the Giants, unlike the Jets, find themselves in the right conference. They do. There's more room for mobility and upward trajectory in the wide open NFC than there is in this loaded, top to bottom AFC. Division might be tough. Giants got to show you they could beat either Philly or Dallas. But the idea of buying regression, and we'll spend a lot more time on this over the next few weeks with the Giants. Ben against Brian Dable, I would not advise it. Just a little food for thought. We'll be back next week as we set the stage for Labor Day weekend and football season starting for real. Who's going to win more games? The Jets and the Giants. We'll have you on that next week. We out? This is New York, New York, presented by our friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook. The local language is coming right back. <laughs> 